the holidays, when I was young, I would enjoy getting on my back un- with my head under the Christmas tree and squinting up through the tree to the lights. I have no idea what might have prompted me to do this for the first time, but I did it many times, and I loved the smell of pine, and I guess I imagined I was lying on the ground outside and the colored lights were the stars. Later on, as my wife Anne will tell you, I always got a lift from putting the lights on the Christmas tree, and while by then I was a bit too big to get under the tree, I still loved the smell of pine and seeing the lights nicely distributed. It was my own way of pushing back the darkness of winter. This is, of course, something that human beings have been doing for millennia, creating light amidst the darkness with fires and lights and greens and colors. And we do this mentally, too, by calling the darkest time of the year the season of light. Most of the customs, lore, and rituals associated with Christmas, New Year's, and other winter holidays can, of course, be traced back to winter solstice celebration of ancient pagan cultures and back even further in that, than that. In the 3rd century AD, as part of the Roman winter solstice celebrations, the Emperor Aurelius established December 25th as the birthday of the Invincible Sun. And shortly thereafter, in 273, the Christian Church selected this day to represent the birthday of Jesus. And January 6th, the date celebrated as Epiphany in Christendom, and linked with the visit of the Magi, was originally an ancient Egyptian day for the winter solstice. There is a UU curriculum I mentioned earlier for third or fourth graders called Holidays and Holy Days that provides something of a travelogue of cultural and religious celebrations throughout the year. Each holiday was connected with a Unitarian Universalist value, and some of the holidays, especially around Uh, this time of year were acted out for the congregation. There was St. Lucius Day, celebrating a story of a young woman who carried much-needed provisions to persecuted Christians who were hiding in the catacombs under the city of Rome. She would wear a halo of candles to light the way, leaving both her hands free to carry and serve. And so in some years in our church, the youth would recreate a procession during the service with St. Lucia and her attendants. The halo of candles, of course, wouldn't be real. There were many variations of Christmas celebrations of light, and the students learned and shared about them. They created advent wreaths from France. They built Philippine parrels, large and colorful shaped lanterns built with sticks and tissue paper. They played out the Mexican tradition of children carrying lanterns and going from house to house getting sweets as they went replicating Joseph and Mary's search in Bethlehem. And there were other non-solstice celebrations of light that were part of that curriculum. Diwali, for example, one of the most important celebrations in India, was originally a Hindu festival symbolizing the triumph of light over darkness through the story of Lord Rama's return to his kingdom after defeating Ravana. Today, most people in India and around the world, many people in India and around the world, enjoy the five-day celebration of Diwali, and it's one of the many celebrations around the world that honors the creation myths, the foundational stories that involve the separation of light from darkness, day from night, earth from sky, a celebration of light. Today, with our own celebrations originating out of the solstice It's not so much the dark of winter that we're trying to push back, but the darkness of what's going on in the world. From the attacks in Paris, the city of light, to the bombing in Beirut, a few days before that, to the shootings in San Bernardino and our national shame that we experience a mass killing here in the United States roughly close to once a day, to our disturbing social and political reality. It becomes harder and harder to find light and push back with hope. Hanukkah is one winter festival of light that is not derived from the solstice, but from the date of the critical Maccabean victory over the Seleucid Greeks. It freed Jerusalem from their grip and allowed the Jewish people access to the temple. 
It is one celebration that has survived many darknesses, many persecutions, serving over 2,000 years as a symbol of solidarity and hope for the Jewish people. And many of the best Hanukkah stories come out of the most difficult of times. The story of Rabbi Hugo Green tells one worth repeating. Green was a central figure in British Reform Judaism between the mid-60s and his sudden death in 1996. For 32 years, he served the prodigious, prestigious West London Synagogue, a congregation of about 3,000 families. But he was as much loved outside his congregation as he was within. He was active in building interfaith networks across Britain and around the world, and he was a regular contributor to BBC Radio. Hugo was born in the city of Berehovo, Czechoslovakia, in the Carpathian Mountains. And while his childhood was, in his own words, idyllic, the shadow of Nazi Germany steadily lengthened over the region. In the winter of 1944, when Hugo was 13, the Jews of Berehovo, about a third of the population of that city, were confined to their own sector of the town, the Jewish ghetto. And then on August 28th, 1944, all of the approximately 10,000 Jews of that city and region were loaded onto trains and sent to Auschwitz in Poland. Upon arrival, the men and the women were separated, and Hugo was advised to lie and say he was 19 and a carpenter. He did this, and he and his father were put to work. His 10-year-old brother and his grandfather were sent to the gas chambers. It was a time of unspeakable horror, oppression and hardship. The prisoners lived with a constant sense of darkness and doom. But despite that and because of it, many tried to hold on to what they could of Jewish religious observances. One midwinter evening, one of the inmates reminded his fellows that it was the first night of Hanukkah, the festival of lights. And knowing this already, Hugo's father had constructed a little menorah out of scrap metal. For a wick, he took some threads from his prison uniform. For oil, he used some margarine he had somehow obtained from a guard. Such observances were strictly verboten. But Hugo, who was always practical, complained not so much about the risk but about the waste of the precious calories. Wouldn't it be better, he wondered out loud, to share the butter on a crust of bread than to burn it? His father replied gently, Hugo, both you and I know from experience that a person can live a very long time without food. But Hugo, I tell you, a person cannot live a single day without hope. This menorah, his father said, is the fire of hope. Never let it go out. Not here, not anywhere. Remember that, Hugo. For as long as humankind has expressed itself in words, hope and light have been intertwined. Sight is our predominant sense, so it comes as no surprise that our language is rich with metaphorical references to light and darkness. And it's not only true of religious language, but of our secular world as well. The words in the light of are just as easily paired with wisdom and reason as they are with God or scripture. We sometimes describe someone as brilliant. We talk about shedding new light on a subject. Earlier when John used the term renewing the light of Judaism, we knew exactly what that meant. It would be the same if we were talking about the light of Christianity or the, real, the light of humanism. We understand the term to mean the guiding principles, the positive values and the meaningful lessons of a tradition that if followed would lead one towards clarity and a way to live responsibly in the world. There are many lights available to us in this world and we as free thinkers have access to them all. Some we choose some we reject. And then there's the light of truth telling us about ourselves. Truth telling that allows each of us to see ourselves what we are doing or allowing that has helped bring upon us some of the darkness that we feel. 
This is a light we need to hold high. There's a festival of light that has a more individual focus and which is not centered on the solstice. On the evening of the full moon of the 12th month in the traditional Thai lunar calendar, the people of Thailand celebrate Loi Krathong. Loi means to float, and Krathong is a lotus-shaped vessel made traditionally of banana bark. The Thai people create their Krathong, which usually contains a candle, and floats them out into a river or stream. The history behind this festival is complex, and Thais celebrate for many reasons. The holiday falls at the end of the rice harvest, so people take this time to thank the water goddess for a year's worth of abundant supply, as well as an apology for polluting the waters. And some believe that this is a time to symbolically float away the anger and grudges that they've been holding. So they often include a fingernail or a lock of hair as a way of letting go of the dark side of themselves, to start anew, free of negative thoughts. There's also the hope that if your candle stays lit until the krathong disappears out of sight, you will have a year of good luck. The deeper story is that this festival was adapted centuries ago by Buddhists in Thailand to honor the Buddha. The candle venerates the Buddha with light, while floating the krathong symbolizes the letting go of one of one's attachments, the greed, the hatred, the anger. This is a celebration of light that appeals to me, for it's so hard to find hope some days in the big picture. There is much, in fact, that gives us pause and cause to wonder where we can find a kernel of hope. And while we might try to find it in a faraway vision of a better world, however we describe it, As much as we would like to evoke that sense of vision for our own purposes and our own promise, hope, I think, is found in the small things. As I was writing this, I was reminded of an experience from my chaplaincy training at North Shore Hospital in Beverly, Massachusetts. It was early in the 11-week unit, and I was out on the floor making some of my first rounds. In the oncology ward, I entered a room where there were two women, one patient in her 80s, and a visitor maybe about my age. I learned on that first visit that the patient was from an old New England family, and when I asked, she told me very proudly she was still an active congregationalist. Her visitor, a Vietnamese woman, turned out to be her daughter-in-law, and I couldn't help notice over my continued visits during the week that she was remarkable in her attentiveness and love for the patient. She was always there, always smiling, always welcoming and ready to give up her chair near the bed. When a meal came in, she would arrange it carefully so that everything was nicely presented. She had learned that you couldn't burn a candle in the hospital, so she had provided one of those fake candles to give off a steady and calming light. But it really was the woman herself, this daughter-in-law, who, with her smile and her compassion and her presence, was providing all the warm light in the room. I don't know what happened to the two of them. I missed a day on another assignment, and when I returned, they were gone. And there was another patient for for me to sit with. And as I sat in that familiar chair... The lesson sank in, and I knew more deeply my role in that room. If there is meaning for us, it is to see clearly both the big picture and the minute details, to see, as Victoria Safford expressed in today's meditation, the beauty where there is beauty and the violence where there is violence, to know that we are part of a great and unfolding creation, and and that what we do matters. What we see and how we reflect it back out into the world is critical. If we struggle to be open and just and compassionate with each other, what chance have we in the wider world? But if we can model here what it is we wish in the world, then we can indeed make of ourselves a light and together shine even more brightly. 
In his last book published posthumously, Hugo Green closed with these words. Time is short and the task is urgent. Evil is real, so is good. There is a choice and we are not so much chosen as choosers. Life is holy, all life, mine and yours and that of those who came before us and the life of those who come after us. And Victoria Safford has written in her own personal credo that the only model or clue available to us is the model of creation itself. What we know empirically is the gorgeous creativity of the unfolding universe and especially the earth. When we have doubts about our calling, it might be wise simply to imitate the creative impulse of the cosmos, to join with it, to act like stars which live and shine for no other person, no other reason than to explode and die, contributing their energy to some larger, timeless process. A true celebration of light, a worthy credo for us all.
In times of darkness, we stumble toward the beckoning flame. In times of cold, we seek the cozy fire. In times of repression, we reach for the lamp of truth. In times of loss, we look toward the warmth of community. In times of joy, we light a candle of celebration. May we always find the light we need that brings us home to hope. And let's join together in singing our closing hymn number 331, Life is the Greatest Gift of All. Rise in body or spirit. Go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return to no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all beings. Have a wonderful day.